Good evening, Mrs. Tooley. Nice to meet you. Good evening. How kind of you to call. Let me introduce myself. My name is Phoebe Haynes Woodworth Tooley. I was born in New Jersey. The very, very same year that President Abraham Lincoln was born, right over there in Kentucky, the same state that my husband, John C. Tooley, is from. My father, the Reverend, Just, Reverend Judge Seth Woodruff, in 1816, decided that it was time for us to move. So he gathered Mama and us five children and put us on a stagecoach, which we rode from New Jersey all the way to Pittsburgh. And then he put us on a flatboat, and we rode that flatboat all the way down the Ohio River till we came to Louisville. Mm. We settled into Louisville. But my father was an avid abolitionist. He couldn't stay there long. Within just a few months, he got the family all together again and moved us to our permanent home here in New Albany. He's often been called the father of New Albany because he was such an important man after the early deaths of the Scribner brothers. My father could do anything. He was the judge here in New Albany. He also kept a tavern, set harness, laid brick, made stones, and on Sunday, he was your Baptist minister. <laughs> Let me tell you a little secret. Before there was a courthouse here in New Albany, he held those trials right in our house, the tavern, because it was the largest frame building in New Albany. My husband was a, my father was a natural leader. It was during this time that 43 people came across the river to after one of our citizens. It was a black man named Moses. He said he was a free black man. They said he was a runaway slave. It created such a ruckus that he called out Colonel Poston to solve everything and settle it all down. My father said that Moses would have a fair trial, and he did. During that trial, it was decided that yes, he was a free black man. He was born in Clark County. Sheriff Bessie set him free immediately. Those Kentuckians were so upset and angry that it took those New Albany boys a little while, but they got them back to the river and sent them back from whence they came. <laughs> My husband, John C. Tooley, was a grain and fruit merchant, keeping things so fresh that he transported down to New Orleans by flatboat by himself. He was a daring and adventuresome man. Sadly, he died in California. He was walking along the rail. We do not know if he heard the signal, but we know that it was given. He didn't move, perhaps thinking that he had plenty of clearance. But the cars were very broad in that train, and they caught his coat, threw him onto the tracks, cut off his leg below the knee. He was immediately rushed to the hospital, and they took off his leg above the, above the knee, trying to save him. But sadly, he died at 2 p.m. that morning. Our son Enos lived in New Albany for 17 years, but after his father's death, he was offered a job by the Louisville Post Office. He eagerly took this job, and I'm so proud he holds this job still today. He did take a few months off to be the paymaster during our recent war. In 1864, he met the love of his life, Mary C. Speed. Now, Mrs. Speed was the granddaughter of Lincoln's Attorney General, James Speed, and the niece of British poet, John Keats. As you can tell, well tell, it was time for me to return and live with them and my six adorable grandchildren. Little Philip Tooley is just two and the love of my life. Little Speed Tooley is three and he's into everything. I'm here to visit with my sister, Mary C. Tooley, here in New Albany, but I fear the visit may be permanent. All right, thank you so much, Anne, baby.
You take it easy. I'll introduce myself. My name is Squire George Washington Tooley, and, and I'm the Squire of Silver Hills. Ottoman said the sun was going down behind the Silver Hills, and the evening was beautiful. Aunt Phoebe had come to visit my mother, Mary Crane Woodruff Paxson Tooley. And it was Colonel Paxson who gave the old Caney Knob property to my mother, but he died. And so she married Colonel Tooley. Two years later, I was born. Even as a five-year-old, I remember the Great Flood of 1832, the flood of the century. But, but mind you, these things don't always come out just exact. It, it could come five years early, so be prepared, because it might even come five years late, as late as 1937. In the 1840s, the banks froze all along the river. I skated all the way to the county line at Knob Creek. That wasn't enough. I skated all the way up to Utica. Well, that was 50 miles round trip up river and up, boys. Let me tell you, I was pretty slick. <laughs> 1851, my daddy died. And I decided to strike out on my own, and I built a home on, on top of our Highland farm. Now, you see, I was a cabinet maker for the famous steamboats here in town, and two of the very newest ones that I'd worked on were the Eclipse and the Shopwell. They were fitted out like grand hotels, but they were fierce rivals. And it was determined in 1853 that the greatest of all steamboat races would take place between the two of them all the way from New Orleans to Louisville. Well, for safety's sake, the Eclipse was sent ahead first. She made a quick trip, only made a few stops along the way, and short stops. She picked up a groom in Memphis and left the bride on the dock. <laughs> <laughs> they dropped him off in Paducah. Now, I was the only resident and the first resident of Silver Hills, but Hundreds of thousands of dollars had been bet on the outcome of this race, so hundreds of people gathered up there with me when they thought it was time for her to come into sight. And sure enough, at 7.30 that evening, the shrill of her steam whistle blew, and you could see the smoke rising over the trees around the bend from her black stacks. As she hove into view, a great shout went up from the congregation, You'd have thought that there was a camp meeting on the heights of Silver Hills. When she pulled into the dock, a cannon went off to mark the time, and the shot well was on her way. Now, those boys claimed that they came in five minutes early, but that outcome was much in dispute, and the New Orleans paper said all bets were off and declared it a tie. However, much to the satisfaction of Captain Elliott of the shot well, the people of St. Louis did give him the antlers for at least the Mississippi portion of the run. 1863, Mama sold our Highland farm to the four of us boys, Brother William, Brother Benjamin, Brother Seth, named after the Reverend Judge, our grandfather, and me. 1871, my wife died. Kathy Evans Tooley. She left me with our son, George Jr. Two years later, I'm married to Harry Compton. Our daughter Hattie lives with me still. Her mother battled the cancer and we laid her to rest in Louisville's Cave Hill Cemetery. Now since then, I've, I've, I've rebuilt the old home. But I still work the farm because blessed is the man who can make two blades of grass grow where only one grew before. And you've got to get up pretty early in the morning to beat me. That's 4 a.m. And you've got another thing coming if you think you can beat my trotter, Doc. <laughs> now, one of these days, I suppose I won't be able to rise up in the morning quite so early. When that happens, you can just plant me on the farm, too. I've got a nice little mausoleum built up there. And when the fevers of this fitful life is o'er, 
here I would repose. So if you come to look for me, that's where you find me. Up there, looking down on you. <laughs> Sophie Squire, <laughs> since you start your day at 4 a.m., which is a lot earlier than any of us, I think you're pretty tuckered out. I think we'll let you get some rest. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.